Philippians right now. We're going to be diving in uh, Philippians 3, uh, 1 through 16 is where we'll be. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn there. It'll be up on the screen as well. Um, hey, you know what? I forgot my little clicker. It should be back there somewhere. Can somebody locate that and bring that up to me? That would be great. Uh, hey, so a few years ago, uh, the MIT Technology Review uh, did a study. Thanks. Uh, that's the Massachusetts in- Institute of Technology up in, obviously, Massachusetts. They did a study. They did a study on hipsters. Do you know what a hipster is? Oh, uh, yeah, he thought it was me. <laughs> good one, good one. Yeah, basically, a hipster is someone who, like, tries to kind of go out and do their own unique uh, style, you know, so like, that, that's, it's man buns, it's a lot of coffee. Uh, yeah, I feel like maybe jean jackets might be an, an element of it. Anyway, they did this study, and then when they, they, they released this study on hipsters, and there was actually a purpose of the study. I'm going to read it, it just straight from the article. It said, what the study found essentially was that when a group of people decide to be different, to do something non-conforming, there comes a point when they all end up adopting the same behavior or the same style. <laughs> That's kind of what they found. So they, they released this study, and on the picture, the, the front of this study was a picture of a guy who was like a hipster. He had like a plaid shirt on, man bun, kind of a beard. And so this guy contacted them and said, hey, you used my picture without my consent. And he said, hey, like that, that's me on the front. Like, and I'm, you know, I've, I've been a model, and so like, this is like valuable to me. You used my picture without my consent. What's going on? And it's like, oh, I'm sorry. And so they like, looked into it, and they're like, no, that's, turns out that's not you. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, you're right. That's not me. <laughs> and he proved the whole study by just like, like claiming that was him. He realized, oh, you know, maybe in my pursuit of being non-conforming and unique, I actually ended up looking like everyone else. Like what he, what he was looking for, he looked for something uh, to, he, he looked for something to put his confidence in. He wanted to put his confidence in something and being kind of different, being my own person. And in pursuing that, he realized, oh, that actually is not something that can hold up the weight of my confidence. And that's actually something that Paul talks about in this passage tonight, Philippians 3, 1 through 16. We're going to see there's a whole list of things that Paul talks about that we can potentially put our confidence in that he once put his confidence in, but it turns out that it's like sand. It cannot sustain the weight of our trust, of our faith. So let's get to the scriptures, Philippians 3, uh, verses 1 through 16. Paul says, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. If you've been with us any amount of time, you've seen this word rejoice a lot. He says, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, great tribe, by the way, Uh, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. There's a lot here. It's a long passage. As we talked about, kind of the main kind of goal of this is Paul is giving us a view of what does the life of a real Christian look like? What does authentic, real Christianity look like? Kind of the big idea we're going to see today is the life of a Christian centers around knowing and pursuing Jesus. The life of a Christian, of a follower of Jesus, it centers around knowing Jesus and it centers around pursuing a relationship with Jesus. 
So we're going to go through this passage, and oh, just a note, um, I'm going to say the word circumcision a lot tonight, so just get used to it. Uh, <laughs> it's important we understand, though. It's important we understand that this term is not like this, this kind of cringy term that we experience it today. Like in Scripture, it's just not that. It's, in this culture, it's not. It actually had actual significance to it. This is something that actually set apart God's people from the very beginning from when he called Abraham to follow him. This is something that set them apart. Now, the problem began when the Israelites began to think, oh, this actually makes us inherently better, God's favor is upon us, and we are actually better. That, that's where the problem comes from. So some important context about our Philippians passage is that in Paul's day, there, and, and as he's writing to this church at Philippi, there's a group of Jews who call themselves Christians, but they taught that to be a Christian, you had to follow the Jewish law. They're saying, you, you, you've got to follow all the Jewish law, then you can be a Christian. And including that, for males, it would be to be circumcised. And so we read about these guys in Acts 15. They, actually, they are actually literally equating this physical act with salvation. And this teaching had apparently shown up in Philippi because Paul addresses it here in verse 2. Paul calls the, the, the people that are teaching this, he says that they're mutilators of the flesh. He kind of calls them a pretty strong term because Paul's speaking against those who are teaching that physical acts can lead to salvation. Paul is speaking against those who teach the formula that Jesus plus something else equals salvation. Paul is warning them about those who are saying that Christianity is first about doing something rather than being about knowing someone. So Paul is warning them because he loves these people. He's saying, hey, watch out. And notice I said the Christian life is first about doing something rather than knowing someone. Because the reality is, is that the Christian life is first about a righteousness that is through faith in Christ. That is what is first in the life of a Christian. Then it is about living a life that responds to that faith. This is so important. If we get the order of these things wrong, then we've, it, we've got it wrong altogether. If we get the order of works or salvation, which one comes first and which one flows out of the other one, if we get that wrong, then we've missed the gospel altogether. We've missed the whole point. So here's an example about how order really does make a difference. Uh, there's a book called The Elements of Eloquence. That's a great title for a book, Elements of Eloquence. And did you know that in English, there's a particular order for adjectives when they're describing a noun? Did you know this? In English, there's a particular order. There's like categories that the adjectives have to go in before they modify, before they describe a noun. This is a little picture of, of the book, from an excerpt of the book. So the order that adjectives have to go in before they describe a noun is opinion, size, age, shape, color, origin, material, purpose, and then the noun. Like This is like something that's like, it's just true in the English language. Nobody really knows exactly why, but we all actually tend to know this even subconsciously. If we get these adjectives out of order, it tends to sound really bizarre. So for example, this, this says, uh, lovely, little, old, rectangular, green, French, silver, whittling, knife. So obviously that's a lot of adjectives. If you start to mess with the order of that, it sounds really weird. So you can have, say, a lovely, little, whittling knife. You could have that. But if you say a uh, whittling, little, lovely knife, like our brains just kind of short out for a second. The order really does matter. And this has been fascinating to me, how our language, we, we just kind of know the order of things does matter. And this, this is the same as is true in our, when you talk about works and salvation and our faith in Christ. Which one comes first? Paul does not want the Philippians to get this wrong. He doesn't want them to get the order of which comes first, works or salvation. I don't want this for you. It's too important. It's too important. And we easily slip into a mindset that puts works before salvation. You know, Gary talked about uh, Hinduism on, on Friday. We're going to learn more about it. We learned more about what Muslims believe this past Friday. I, I've learned about a whole lot of religions in my life, and I've, I've talked and read about people who know a whole lot more than I do. And there's something that every other religion, apart from Christianity, has in common, and that's that works build up and stack up and lead into salvation. The difference between Christianity and every other worldview or religion is that works flow out of salvation. Salvation comes first and then the works flow out of that. And the order is incredibly important. And I love what Paul's done here. He's trying to communicate this to the Philippians and I think he succeeds. He's a great teacher. He has something important to tell them and he's trying to communicate what a true believer is. And he's telling them what real, authentic Christianity is. But instead of only just telling them what it is, he also tells them about something that it's not. 
And he doesn't just mention any random thing. Like He doesn't say that uh, Christianity is not making a butter sculpture of a unicorn and bowing down to it every other Thursday, which would be a pretty epic religion, but that's the, beside the point. <laughs> like He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that's not something that was happening in the culture. He addresses something that was real, that was happening, that the Philippians were hearing, and he's saying, no, no, that is not it. That is not what following Jesus is about. He says to watch out for people who preach that message. So what is the life of a Christian really like? What does it entail? Paul tells us that the the Christian life, the life of a Christian centers around a person and a pursuit. This is what he's getting at here. He's saying, no, 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 it's it's not about following a bunch of laws that lead into salvation. No, it's about a person and it's about a pursuit of a relationship with that person. Specifically, it's about knowing Jesus and then persistently pursuing eternal things for your entire life here on earth. Paul's telling this to the Philippians. This is like the main message of the New Testament. And honestly, this is a message that runs all throughout Scripture. We see this in Psalm 73. The writer of Psalm 73 is Asaph. He says, Whom have I in heaven but you? Earth has nothing I desire besides you. Talking to God. You know who Solomon is? Solomon's son of David. He's the third king of Israel. This guy had more money, resources, wisdom than anybody Ever. Like, it, it, we can't even quantify how rich Solomon was, and he used every bit of his resources to pursue every road that you can think of to pursue for fulfillment in this life. He goes to the end of these roads, and he comes back and he writes the book of Ecclesiastes. And the book of Ecclesiastes basically chronicles his whole pursuit of finding fulfillment in earthly things. And at the end, Ecclesiastes 12 13, he says that this is the end of the matter. All has been heard, and he says this, Now all has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Like, that's the conclusion. Fear God, keep his commandments, this is the duty of all mankind. Did you catch that? That's a person in a pursuit, right? This is the message of the Bible all throughout. I wanted to mention Solomon because I know that there are some, uh, maybe maybe many uh, in this room, who are not convinced that knowing Jesus more will actually be better for your life. I know that there is someone in this room who is not convinced that knowing him more will be better for your life. Now, there might be many who, who say that, maybe think it in your heart, but the, 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 thought, the thought of knowing Jesus more is actually better for my life, that thought never makes it from here to here. It never makes it from your head to your heart. It never makes it from information to transformation. And that's what God's word does in our lives. It transforms us. I just want to tell you that this guy Solomon, he, he followed the road all the way down to the end and he came back and he told us, it's not worth it. Fear God and keep his commandments. Believe Solomon. Believe Paul in this passage. Paul is telling us the same thing. He's saying, man, I, I've followed these roads and I'm coming back and I'm telling you, knowing Jesus is the best thing that you can do with your life. That is the best relationship that you can pursue. Prioritize it, make it number one in your life. So don't ignore that message tonight. So let's talk about it. What, what, is, what does it mean to, to, to follow, to, to know a person, to know Jesus better? Well, I think the way we know that Paul is telling us to know Jesus better is in these 16 verses... Paul says something like, he says something like in Christ Jesus or to know Christ Jesus. He says it 10 times, 10 times in just these 16 verses. He says, we boast in Christ Jesus. He considers gains a loss for the sake of Christ. He considers everything a loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He wants to gain Christ. He wants to be found in Christ. He talks about righteousness that only comes through faith in Christ. He wants to know Christ. He wants to become like him. He says that Christ Jesus took hold of him. He says that God has called him heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's the 10 times that Paul mentions Jesus or Christ in this passage. He's making it clear that knowing Jesus is central. It's central to the life of a Christian. And so he expands on this in verse 3. He says that true believers do three things. Serve God by his spirit, boast in Jesus Christ, and then put no confidence in the flesh. So first he says that a true Christian will serve God by his spirit. Now, notice that even our service to God is not done on our own. Even our service to God is done through his spirit and done with help from God. So we we serve God by his spirit. Secondly, he says that we boast in Jesus. 
We boast in Jesus. And we usually think of boasting as a, generally a bad thing, but Paul says, no, boast in what Jesus has done. Boast in who he is. This past Sunday at my church, we sang a song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. We sang it a few uh, Tuesdays ago here. One of the verses of that, uh, that song says, I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection. A Christian boasts in Jesus, who he is and what he has done. And the third thing Paul says is that a Christian will put no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. What does he mean by that? Well, the, the word that we translate uh, flesh here, it's a diversion of the Greek word uh, uh, sarx, simply means something that is not of God, something that is worldly. And Paul is saying, no, a Christian puts no confidence in those things. And we'll talk more about what those things are in a second. But Paul says, no, no, we don't, we don't put our confidence in those things. We put our confidence, we boast in Jesus. So Paul, he, he lists these three things, just three characteristics of a true Christian. And then he expands on them. He takes an interesting path to expand on these. Because he basically says, he basically says, well, you think you have reason to be confident and to boast in these things. Well, I've got more. I've got more reason to boast in these things. I mean, I'll, I'll beat you at your own twisted little game. That's basically what he's saying here in this passage. Verses 5 and 6, he lists off all the things that he's done to the max. Verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Is Paul being prideful here? Like he's listing off all of these accomplishments. No, he's not being prideful here. What he's doing is he's listing off these things that people could put their confidence in. He's highlighting them, and he's highlighting their insufficiency for salvation. He's saying, no, these things do not lead to salvation, to being right with God. Uh, one, one of the questions we often talk about uh, around here at the BSM is the question of, you know, if you died tonight and you stood before God and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven, what would your response be? It's just a good diagnostic question. It gets a conversation going and you really get into some spiritual things. It's like, you know, what would you say? That's a good thing to think about. Paul, he, he actually lists some things here that are insufficient, that if, if, if they were listed as an answer to that, would not be sufficient for salvation. Uh, Tony Marita, he's a, a pastor, he's an author in North Carolina. He uh, is talking about this passage. He actually lists out, he identifies what Paul is listing here as things that, that he could put his confidence in. Let's, let's see how many of these apply uh, to you. The first thing he says is ritual. Ritual, circumcised on the eighth day. So maybe, maybe you're trusting in baptism. Maybe you're trusting in the, the fact that you walked an aisle at some time in your life. Maybe like that act is what you're basing your confidence in. Ritual. Paul says, I'm circumcised on the eighth day. That was a ritual that was done for the Israelites. Another thing is race. Paul says, I'm of the people of Israel. You know, maybe you think you're part of a special group of people that God favors. And that doesn't even necessarily have to be what we think of as race today. Some people equate the country of America with God's special favor. But I want to tell you, God is calling people to himself from every tribe and every tongue. Paul's saying, I'm, I'm of the people of Israel. Rank of the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin had many great people that came from it. Sometimes it was kind of held in great esteem in the nation of Israel. I mean, this is likely who Paul was is named after. His more Hebrew uh, name is, is Saul, and then he was probably named after the first king of Israel, whose name was also Saul. Maybe, maybe, so maybe, you're, maybe your parents or your grandparents we're strong believers in the Lord. Maybe they have a legacy of following the Lord, and that is something that you're trusting in. You're putting your confidence in. Tradition. Paul says Hebrew of Hebrews. I don't know, maybe your confidence is in being a good student. Maybe that's something that is, that is very valuable in your family. Maybe there's a tradition of high academic achievement in your family, and you're, and you're in that, and that's what you're putting your confidence in and putting all of your effort into. Tradition. Maybe morality. Paul says, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. Now, we tend to think of Pharisee automatically as a bad thing, but he's saying, in this context, like Pharisees were held in high esteem. They were guys who followed the law to the letter. They even made up their own laws that they would, then they would follow those. <laughs> these guys, these guys, they knew the law forwards and backwards. And so many today are putting their confidence in being a good person. 
following the law. And one, one problem with the definition, or one problem with, with trying to be good is that that definition of good is a moving target. Right? We, we, we often, that's what the Pharisees found. They tried to be good and follow the law, and then they would add more. Oh, I got to follow these now. Oh, I got to follow these now. I got to follow these now. And they got so far from God's word that they didn't know exactly what they were doing. You know, Tony Marita, when he's talking about this passage, he said that many people think that if they're somewhere in between Ted Bundy and Mother Teresa, then you're good to go. Right? I guess sometimes somewhere between the worst serial killer you can imagine and, you know, arguably one of the greatest, just most compassionate human beings ever to live. If you're somewhere in there, then you're good to go. But that is insufficient. Morality is not bad. Morality is just not enough. It is not enough. It is insufficient for salvation. What about sincerity? Paul says, as for zeal, persecuting the church. Like he, his, his zeal for, for honoring God led him to do something pretty dramatic, and that was to lock Christians up, put them in jail. We hear about sincerity a lot today. We hear this today. Live your truth. You know, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere about it. This, this is a, a common mindset in today's uh, culture. The, the problem is you can be sincerely wrong. You know, like today, Gary and Teresa were talking about going to, to Paris, Paris, France this summer. If they buy tickets to Paris, Texas instead, like they can be sincere about going there, but are they going to be disappointed when they get there? Uh, yeah, they're going to be disappointed when they get to Paris, Texas instead of Paris, France, right? Well, you can be sincere about it, but you can be wrong. Uh, lastly, rule keeping. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. This is related to morality. Maybe you're thinking, you know, I've never killed anyone. I've never cursed out anyone. I've never, I've never I don't know, caused a wreck on the freeway. I've, I've, I've not done all these things. You know, I just kind of live my life, try not to hurt anybody. That's going to be good enough for me. Now, Paul, Paul, he lists all these things that people could place their confidence in, that he could place his confidence in, that he once did place his confidence in. And he's saying, nope. All of these things are unable to sustain the weight of our confidence, of our faith. Do you have confidence in the chair you're sitting in? I hope so. You walked in, you had a need, needed to sit somewhere, right? So you saw a chair and you chose to place your confidence in that chair, right? Anybody sitting right now is doing exactly that. You're placing all of your confidence in that chair. We can't help it. We, we can't help placing our confidence in something that's wired in us in humans. And if we place that confidence in anything else other than Jesus and what he has done for us, and that is placing confidence in the flesh, whatever it is, it cannot sustain that weight. It is insufficient for salvation. So it's kind of like if all the chairs in this room are made of cardboard, right? And then just immediately collapsed, you know? Now, some of you might actually last for a little bit in a chair made of cardboard, but eventually it would collapse, right? Because it cannot sustain that weight. This is the list of things that Paul writes to the church of Philippi. He's saying, these things were going to let me down. So they've already let me down, so I am counting them as loss, I am not placing my confidence in them. I've counted it as loss. So, well, you know, for example, if you've invested in the production of a Will Smith movie, you might want to go ahead and count, count that as loss, right? <laughs> too soon? Sorry, too soon. Get that out of here. Get that out of here. <laughs> That's going to be a loss for you, probably, for a little bit. Anyway, going, going ahead in uh, verses 7 and 8, he continues. Paul continues, he says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. So in, in verse seven, he says that all these things could be counted as gains, but he considers them lost. Like what kind of gains? Like these kind of gains? Is this what he's talking about? Like, that would be pretty cool, honestly, if just following Jesus meant that we all ended up like that. I don't know, maybe not for everybody, but I don't know. Have you ever known somebody, though, who was just, like, jacked, you know, at, at the gym all the time? They were just jacked, but they were kind of a jerk, kind of a jerk about it. Like, I, I think all of us probably has someone that comes to mind. Gains can puff up our ego, like physical gains, like muscular gains. They can puff up our ego just like anything else can. And Paul's saying this is actually what happened to him. 
This is what happened to him. He had these gains. He had these spiritual, these academic, these, these cerebral gains. He was an intelligent dude. But he reached a point where he counted all those gains as loss. Why? For the sake of Christ, to know the person of Jesus better. This is why Paul counted his, what he used to count as gains, he counted them as loss. Now, he uses a particular word here. He says, I, all those things I just listed that I used to value, I put my confidence in those things. He says, I'm counting them as garbage. All right, garbage. This is the only time that this, this is actually the only time that this Greek word is used. It's, it's a unique Greek word. It's not used anywhere else uh, in the New Testament. Uh, some translations like this one use garbage. Some use rubbish. Uh, some use dung. Uh, it's, it's generally something around that. Some scholars think that these translations are actually a little bit tame. They think that this word is actually even more potent and actually has a stronger meaning to it, maybe similar to what chickens do in the yard. Now, I've decided I'm not going to curse from stage tonight, but <laughs> this is potentially what Paul is getting at. He's saying he's using a very strong word, and he's saying, I am counting everything that I just listed. I'm counting it as garbage, as rubbish, as dung compared to knowing Jesus. He's using a very vibrant word, strong word, and he likens everything in this list to this worst form of garbage. Just sit with that for a second. All the things that Paul listed, he says, I'm counting those as garbage, rubbish, dung, compared to knowing Jesus. Any action that you are depending on right now to be right in God's eyes is the same as garbage. If we are counting on it, to be right before God, to gain salvation before God. It's, it's the same as if we offered God the worst kind of garbage. So what does Paul say is right then? If, if all those things that, that we tend to put our confidence in, if those are wrong, what is right? He says, I consider that whole this garbage that I may gain Christ be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. So what is it that makes us right before God? It's being found in Christ. This is what makes us right before God, being found in Christ. Going back to that scenario of if God asks you, hey, why should I let you into heaven? Your answer is if, if he finds you in Christ. God will let you be with him and be right with him and have that eternal relationship with him if he finds you in Christ. God is perfectly righteous. There is no sin in him. And he only allows perfectly righteous people to have a relationship with him, to be with him eternally. This has been his standard since the beginning. Now, none of us are righteous. None of us are righteous, not even one. Psalm 14 says that. Romans tells us that repeatedly. So if none of us has what it takes, then we have to find it in someone else. Right? If we don't have what it takes to be right before God, we've got to find it in someone else. And this is why Paul talks about a righteousness that is through faith in Christ. Again, the life of a Christian centers around knowing a person, Jesus. Verse 10, Paul says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. Paul wants to know Christ, not just be aware, him, aware of him, not just to know about him, not just to be around people that know him, not just any of those things, but to know him. To know him on a one-on-one -on -one level, on an intimate, personal level. There is nothing greater than knowing Jesus more. At the beginning of each year, I usually try to take some time just to, uh, to get away for a little bit, uh, just in prayer, and reading the Word, and just kind of thinking about the year ahead of me. And I've, I've kind of started just thinking about a word for the year. And that's, it's, it seems kind of hokey to me at the beginning. I've really kind of appreciated it as the years have gone by. Uh, my word for this year, for whatever reason, my word is deeper. And I... At the beginning of this year, I just really, I really had just an overwhelming sense of, man, I want to know Jesus more. And so I put this picture, this picture is the background to so any computer that I get on. I just have the word deeper there. I love nature. I, I, I love being out in nature and just like, I feel like I just talk with God really easily out in nature. So this word deeper is anything that I do, I want to have this, I want to have this word constantly in front of me. It's just one of my little ways that I remind myself that knowing Jesus more, there is nothing better than that. There is nothing better than that. So the life of a Christian centers around knowing and pursuing Jesus. So let's talk about that pursuit. 
verses 12 to 14, this is what Paul gets at. He says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying that knowing Jesus is a continual process until we are face-to-face with Jesus. And he says something pretty stunning, actually. He says, I'm not there yet. It's pretty surprising if you know a little bit about Paul at this point in his life. The Apostle Paul, writer of 13 books of the New Testament, not quite at this point, But he's done a lot of things by this point in his life. He's done a lot of things for the kingdom of God. He's not where he wants to be in knowing Jesus. So does he despair? Does does he just like sit in discouragement? No, no. He describes his posture. He describes his orientation, his mindset. All of these are summed up, I think, in the word pursuit. Forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead. I think this is important to understand for us. We forget what is behind. We strain toward what is ahead. All we are given is the present. You ever think about that? That's all we have. We only have the present. The past is gone. The future isn't isn't here yet. All we have is the present. What are we going to do in the present? We live in the present. We are affected by our past, sure. The past used to be our present, right? So the things that happened to us in the past have effects on us today. What, what, was, what was Paul's past? It was bad things, and it was good things. I think every one of us in here can probably say that to some degree. There's bad things in our past. There's some good things in our past. Up to this point in his life, he was a highly educated man of God who would let his zeal carry him to imprison Christians, send them to their deaths. And then he had dramatically, in dramatic fashion, Jesus called him to follow him, and so he did. And he became one of the most influential people in the early church, planting churches, raising up leaders, teaching others how to follow Jesus. So so lots of bad, but lots of good. And he's saying that he's forgetting it all and straining toward what is ahead. I think there's wisdom here because there's a danger to us. The danger to us is that we can think our actions either qualify us for or disqualify us from God's favor. This is dangerous. This is a dangerous place for us to be thinking that our actions either qualify us for or disqualify us from God's favor. Either way, it's fatal to our spiritual lives if we persist in it for an amount of time. We either become falsely inflated or falsely deflated in our sense of self and how in our, our worth and how are we doing before God. So a key part of pursuing Jesus is properly understanding our past. It's not about our good and bad actions. It's about who we place our faith in. We've got to get that right first. Don't live in the past. Don't be stuck in the past. I know for many of us, there's pain, pain in our past. And there are different ways that we need to deal with that because it affects our present, right? But if we're not careful, we can be stuck in the past and forget, man, that God has so much good for us in the future. (laughs) You ever seen the movie Napoleon Dynamite? I feel like it might be less and less popular these days, but I feel like a lot of people still see Napoleon Dynamite. There's a character from that movie, Uncle Rico. I don't know Uncle Rico. He's become a kind of a cultural example of living in the past. You know, Uncle Rico quotes, you know, Oh, back in 82, I could throw a pigskin a quarter mile. <laughs> uh, he says, yeah, how much you want to make a bet? I can throw a football over the mountains. You know, he's sitting there talking with Kip. All these things, oh, oh yeah, yeah. My favorite is, you know, oh, if coach put me in the fourth quarter, we want to win state. No doubt, no doubt in my mind. And then he takes a stake and then throws it and hits Napoleon Dynamite in the face. It's, yeah. <laughs> Uncle Rico lives in the past. Don't be Uncle Rico. <laughs> Sometimes we can think, we can either, whether it's, whether it's good, whether it's bad, we can be so stuck of the things that happened to us in the past. And Paul's saying, no, I, I want to I properly forget what is behind. I want to strain toward what is ahead. Because for the Christian, the best part of our lives is always ahead of us when we are face to face with Jesus. That's the best part of our lives that we strain forward to, we pursue that. And so here's what I want to challenge you in, is don't be affected by your past, be affected by your future. 
right? That <laughs> sounds kind of weird at first. What are we talking about here? Are we talking about some kind of time travel? No. How do we be affected by our future? What Paul is doing here in verses 13 and 14, he's keeping in mind a goal. He's keeping in mind a prize. Consider how your actions today affect your future because eternity is real. Eternity is real, and the, and the actions that you engage in today, the mindsets that you have today, the relationships you have today affect your future. So the more we know Jesus, the more we pursue Jesus, the more we realize that our ultimate destination is not just our life here on this earth. There is so much more that Jesus has for us. And th- does that mean that we live our lives out here in some, like, some form of escapist mindset? Like, man, I just need to like, gut it out here, and then I'll just escape this planet, and then I'll be with Jesus. No, it's not just that. No, it's not like we're just enduring this earth until the good stuff comes. No, no. The more we know and the more we pursue Jesus, the more that we understand that he calls us to live this life in light of eternity. One of my favorite quotes ever from a guy named C.T. Studd. He said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. If you say that every morning, that's going to affect your life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. The things we do in this life have eternal effects. The more we think about eternity, the more effect we have in this life. Uh, C.S. Lewis, you know, famous uh, author, he said this. He says, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought most about the next. The ones who thought the most about the next world, they, they were the ones who did the most in this world. This is what Paul's doing here. He's already said in chapter one to live is Christ and to die is gain. We know he already has this balanced view of life and of life here on earth, but also eternity. And so he's saying, I'm pursuing Jesus because of, what it, because of what he has called me to in this life. But there are better things coming and boy, I can't wait. That is the mindset of a follower of Jesus. It's about knowing Jesus, and it's about pursuing a relationship with him until we see him face to face. Let's just talk briefly about how. What does pursuing Jesus look like? This is, where, this is time for some soul searching. Consider the rhythms of your life. Consider relationships of your life. Consider the mindsets of your life. I could have thought of another R. I would have, but no. It's rhythms, relationships, and mindsets. What are, the rhythm, what are your rhythms of life? Just think about it on a very kind of a nitty-gritty level. When do you get up? When do you go to bed? What's the first and the last thing you do every day? What's something you do every day? Are any of these things, or all of these things, are they helping you know Jesus better? What are your rhythms? Are you gathering with other believers? Are you an actual part of a church where you know and are known by a body of believers? I want to say I think many people treat gathering with a church or gathering with other believers as an optional part of your life. And if something gets in the way, then well, so be it. That's okay. I'll get them next time. And, if, and, and, and I think the mindset sometimes, well, you know, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. That doesn't give you salvation. Well, that's true. Talking with your spouse doesn't make you married either. But if you're married, you better talk to your spouse. You're going to find out real quick that a real marriage leads to some talking, Right? <laughs> What are your rhythms of life? Are they leading you to know Jesus better? What are your relationships like? Relationships. Who are your closest friends? You ever heard that you're the average of your five closest friends? That's pretty common, I think. That's a, just a fascinating thought to me. You're the average of your five closest friends. Think about who your closest friends are. Do they value Jesus? Are they genuinely wanting to know Jesus better as well. I think that I count that as one of the most impactful things in my walk with Jesus is that in college, when I was in your shoes, sitting in these chairs, well, different ones, older ones, but I was sitting in this room, my closest friends were people that honestly, they, they challenged me to know Jesus better. I, I didn't have like a super clear picture of that at the time, but man, looking back on it, oh, that is huge for me. Relationships, are your relationships full of conflict? What, what, what can you influence to bring peace in your relationships? And thirdly, mindsets. What mindsets dominate your thinking? Are you more prone to having a, a deflated sense of yourself 
or more of an inflated sense of yourself and more of a prideful sense. I think one, one is pride when you have an inflated sense of yourself. Sometimes a perfectionism can lead to a deflated sense of self. You're just never quite satisfied with, some, with the things that you do. And when, when you think of the question, why should God let me into heaven, does your answer start with because I did whatever action? Does it start with because I did or does it start with because Jesus is righteous and I trust in him? It's got to be the second one. Because Jesus is righteous, I trust in him alone. So I want the, I want the band to come up here, and uh, they're going to lead us in worship as we're closing tonight. But I want, to, I want to take just a couple of minutes, even as the band gets up here, they're just going to play for a couple of minutes, and I just want to have some quiet reflection. Think about rhythms, the rhythms of your life. Think about the relationships in your life. Think about the mindsets in your life. Are there rhythms, are there the, are your habits, are they leading you to know Jesus better? Are they leading you to, to pursue a relationship with him in, in a real way? What are the obstacles to that? Let's just take a couple minutes of quiet reflection and then we'll worship together as we go tonight.